In his lifetime, he has started over 50 businesses and gave strategy to hundreds more. He has found a pattern that every business rises through and falls apart. The question he asks is how to find predictable success. He has written about it in his best-selling book, and educated leaders at the top companies of the world. Every person will have an instant takeaway from this strategic thinker. Plywood presents Les McCown. I want to share with you some stuff uh, today that I've observed over um, a career that's 30-something years now. And I want to do it in a way that I hope is useful to what is a pretty wide-ranging audience. You cover a lot of stuff in what you all do. And so by definition, a little bit of what I'm sharing is going to be at a 30,000-foot level. But I hope I'm going to give you some resources at the end that I hope will enable you to take any part of what I share with you that you might find useful and drill a little deeper. Something happened at some point during my lifetime, and I couldn't precisely uh, pinpoint it, but at some stage, the uh, ability that we have to draw meaningful patterns from the information that's rushing at us uh, became overwhelming. Uh, I can remember, I was born in 1956, and I can remember life when it was in black and white. Some of you may not believe that that was the case, but until 1963, we essentially lived in black and white. And most of what we thought and did was in comparative terms somewhat black and white. If you compare that to what happened when uh, the pace of life was determined by an agrarian cycle, when all you had to do most days was hunt, gather, watch the sun come up, the sun come down, the ability to pull patterns out of the information that was flowing our way was, in relative terms, easier. That's a dumb word to use, right? But it's the best word that I can use. And if you take whatever is your source point of old wisdom, whether it's the I Ching, the Bible, the Upanishads, whatever it might be, you can see the degree of profundity that comes out of the ability to process relatively small amounts of information that are coming in over long periods of time. And then at some point, somewhere about here, somebody invented the stirrup, and people started arriving in villages with, guess what? Information. Oh, our soil isn't like that. We can grow this sort of a stuff. When the rain comes, we do this. And then somebody invented the printing machine, and somebody invented the telephone, and so on and so forth. And at some stage, we got to the point where the flow of information became so overwhelming that most of us don't personally take responsibility for the identification of the underlying patterns that that information brings with it. And we outsource it a lot to experts, to pundits. I want to say pundit just because I like the word pundit better. And what we've seen in recent years is on a whole realm of activities and areas, our ability to make sense of the information that's coming in, in economics, in weather, demographics, even how to prosecute a war in these days of asymmetric battles is confusing. We're still at the point where we've got to pretend we understand all of this, and particularly the experts have got to pretend it. But the reality of trying to make sense of it is difficult. And added to that, you know, we're, we're all just trying to move north in a southbound lane, right? We're all trying to make sense of what's going on. But one of the things that we've had going on for millennia is... Um, when asking for a bar stool to find the height of the bar stool. Uh, um, one of the things that's been going on for years, uh, for millennia, is that uh, any of you conscious of your second voice? You know, it's, it's uh, chittering away right now. You know, who matched that guy's jacket with those 
chinos. Uh, I, don't, I don't understand why we're in a theater. I really liked that music last night. You know, we've all got that second voice going on. And in recent years, I think one of the things that's happened is that with the rise of social media and the rise of cable TV and the rise of the 24-7 news cycle, a third voice has jumped in, which is really the externification of all of our second voices. And we're living more and more constantly in a babble of everybody's second voice. Have you ever, any of you found yourself thinking in tweet format? <laughs> thinking, how do I put that in 140 characters? You know, if we go back to the, to the graph that I showed before, um, in agrarian years, uh, a birth was an event in a village that was a, a mammoth experience and a learning opportunity for many people, as was a death. And now you fire up Facebook and, oh, here's a picture of my kid. Oh, here's a cute dog. Oh, here's a moon landing. Here's a Mars landing. Here's a picture of a cute dog. Here's the birth. We've got this constant flow of information. And one of the things that it does is it drives down our ability to bring clarity in our own thinking. I'm a great fan of social media. There are a number of people here today that I wouldn't know if it wasn't for social media, and they've become great friends. But I think one of the things that it's doing is it's a polluting our ability to see the difference between the important and the noisy. It's polluting our ability to think through the underlying patterns and all of the information that's rushing our way. And if you just tweeted that, by the way, you might not be getting the point. <laughs> if you give it a hashtag, come see me afterwards. And so one of the things that's happened is that I think we'll all agree that earlier generations, particularly the generations that most closely formed our own mindsets or that we responded or reacted to, Many of us, when we look back at the boomers and, and beyond, see an illusion of certainty. You remember the days when you took a job at a plant and you worked there and you worked upwards and you stayed there. You got a house and you stayed and you stayed married. You got a family and they grew up around you. I come, as I said, from Northern Ireland where everybody's only one generation from, away from the land. We still have a mentality there that the default uh, way to, to, to build your family is geographically proximate. But over time, I think what's happened is that we've moved into an illusion of choice. And I'm not against choice by any means. Uh, I think choice is a wonderful thing. And I think it's great to be able to exercise it. But I think one of the things that happens is that because we're so overwhelmed with opinion and information, our ability to differentiate between what's a choice that we can make and a choice we think we can make, but which is going to be distended by important underlying patterns, we're losing that ability to see that. And as a result, we cast around and cast around and try this and try that, and we form thin roots rather than delivering profundity, rather than delivering things that really change the world. And I know many of you are working to do things that you believe to be incredibly important. So what I want to do for the rest of the presentation today is I want to show you the pattern that I've spent my life trying to understand, and I hope that it in itself will be useful to you. But what I want to encourage you to do while you're listening to this is to think also about your responsibility in the area that you're working in, in the activity that matters to you, in the cause that's important to you, about the fundamental importance to step away from what's trendy, what's noisy, what's cool, what's hip, what's frequent, what's ubiquitous, and determine for yourself what's important and everlasting and fundamental, because it's on those foundations that you'll build things that will really make a difference. I want to show you what I mean uh, in the world that I live in, which is um, helping organizations grow, helping organizations succeed. That's what I do. And I want to show you uh, a pattern and four little guys here, guys being a gender-free um, gender, I'll stop digging at this point. Here's what I've discovered. <clears throat> I um, was uh, either fortunate or unfortunate or just uh, in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, by the time I was 35, I had, started, I had started 42 businesses with myself and other people. 
Uh, these were uh, businesses like uh, tool and die manufacturer, which you know probably you can't make, uh, you couldn't start one of those in uh, uh, the first world these days. Uh, uh, economics uh, uh, agency, a publishing company. I owned the uh, master license for Pizza Hut in Ireland. Um, trying to sell flat Italian bread to Irish people, quite a challenge. Uh, the, the Pizza Hut in Belfast is still the only one I know of that has a license to produce fries, chips, because if we didn't have potatoes on the menu, nobody would come in. Um, so I, I started 42 businesses, and then I was, and two of them failed, and I learned a lot from those two that failed, an awful lot. Uh, I then spent 10 years running an incubation company. Uh, the equivalent these days of uh, uh, Techstars, Y Combinator. And I built a business, 100 and something people, 13 offices worldwide, helping launch enterprise after enterprise after enterprise. These weren't all businesses, they were not for profits uh, as well. And together with my partner over those eight years, we probably saw somewhere around 3,000 different enterprises both launch and, and help them grow. And in addition to the 42 that I'd personally worked with, even a dumb Irishman begins to see some underlying patterns. And that was my partner, and he taught them to me. <laughs> and I'm going to share them with you now, without any credit for him. I'm not even going to tell you his name. Um, and here's what I, I discovered over those years. Every enterprise, every organization goes through seven stages. These stages are unavoidable. There is no way that you can't go through them. The only thing that you can do is minimize the time in the tough ones and maximize, optimize the time in the stages that are nice. The stages that are straight lines are theoretically nice stages. One of them is an illusion. The squiggly lines are tough times for any organization. And organizations go through them sequentially, but they can also, unlike our aging process so far, you, they can, organizations can reverse the process and can go back stages. Organizations don't have to go right to the end. They can get up to the peak stage and stay there indefinitely, theoretically, but it's very tough to do. And I want to take you really quickly through those stages, and then I want to tell you why and how this happens. And then I want to tie it back to this overall idea of seeing underlying patterns. First stage is what I call early struggle, and it's probably, you know, okay, you get it. There's an early struggle for any entity. For a commercial organization, it's a struggle to find a sustainable, profitable market. For a not-for-profit or a cause-based or a mission-based organization, it's a struggle to find your voice and an audience for that voice. And if you started something and struggled to really find your voice, really understand how to communicate it in a way that snaps with people, that they say, I get it and I want to help, that's the early struggle phase. Typically takes three to five years, though that's a huge exaggeration. Uh, and to tell anybody under 30 years of age that the early struggle phase is between three to five years, forget it at that point. It ain't going to happen. We're going to make this happen in a year. If you can do that, that's fantastic, and there are some outliers that make that happen. But typically, the, the early struggle phase to really get any organization to the point where it has def got its defined purpose and a future sitting there ready to be taken, as opposed to having to scrabble to stay alive, takes three to five years. Once you get through that stage, and of course the whole point there is that it's a race against time, it's a race to get there before your resources, emotional, physical, financial, all sort, before they run out. If you get through that, you get to the stage that I've given the most complicated name of all, which is fun, and it's fun because it's fun. It's fun because it's not early struggle anymore. It's fun because you've got traction. It's a commercial organization, you've got revenue. If it's a cause-based organization, you've got revenue. Revenue's good, right? Wherever it may be coming from. But most importantly, you know your market. You know who you're talking to. You know who likes your voice. You know who responds to it. And now it's about mining that market. It's about doing the thing that you were meant to do. And the business, the organization, the venture grows rapidly. Here we're in pure evangelization mode. And people are coming to what we're doing because we've got a tight, excited team that have got the basic resources they need to do what you need to do. It's an exciting time. And, it's the, and this is how most people think business, organizational growth, enterprises should be and are. And most people think we've arrived at this point. But what happens is that with that success comes growth. 
and the enterprise grows and it becomes complex. And we begin to have to do things through layers of people, through layers, that's not my Swedish cousin, layers, by the way, layers. <laughs> Get what I'm saying here? Layers. Um, through layers of complexity. And the organization will hit a stage that I call white water. And white water is when that complexity begins to rock the organization's ability to deliver. I mean, rock, not rock. Old fogey, right? Rock. Uh, I mean, rock, shake, the organization's ability to deliver. And this is a very confusing time for most people. It feels like the enterprise is under uh, risk. It feels actually like this stage here. It feels to the people that are running it that we're going through death row. In fact, all that needs to happen is we put some systems and processes in place. We need to put some pure, simple systems and processes in place. Because in fun, we could give a figs something about systems and processes. We just want to get it done, particularly in mission-driven organizations. Screw systems and processes. We're just going to make it happen, and we make it happen, and that's what defines us. That's when we build the myths and legends of our venture. It's whenever we do things that are truly extraordinary, and we get a name and a reputation. And so putting systems and processes in place seems really icky. It's like it's going to slow the whole thing down, and a lot of people decide not to bother. They decide just to go back to being in fun, and that's fine. But if you really want to scale, you've got to put the systems and processes together, and you get to a point that I call predictable success. And what I mean by that is, barring catastrophic external events, minor caveat, um, you can set your goals and achieve them with relative ease. And you can scale your enterprise to whatever size the arena that you're working in will allow. In business, you can scale it to whatever size the industry will allow. So if you want to scale, if you truly want to make a massive difference, not everybody does, but some folks are doing micro superb work, and for them it's right to stay in fun. But if you want to make a huge difference in scale, you've got to choke down the need for systems and processes to get through to predictable success. Theoretically, you can stay there as long as you want. The reality, I'm not going to spend too long on this, is that having put systems and processes in place and got, having got us through to predictable success, guess what we do next? If systems and processes were a good thing, put more in, and we become over-processed. And the organization hits a stage that I call treadmill. And treadmill is essentially the over-processed organization. You know, form becomes more important than function. Completing a checklist becomes more important than the thing the checklist was there for. Putting in FaceTime becomes important. It just gets a bit, uh, or meh, uh, or meh, it's sort of the same. East Coast, huh? West Coast, meh. Flyover states, I don't know. Completely lost my thread, trying very hard to think about where I got to. Uh, treadmill is a natural stage for most organizations. M uh, most organizations tip in there a little bit, come back, maybe even go back into white water a bit, come back, sort of oscillate up here like the RPM reader on a car dash. That's fine. But if you stay in treadmill for too long, what happens is you become numb to the effects of being overprocessed, and you get to like it. And the organization tips forward into a fatal stage that I call the big rut. And in the big rut, you've lost the ability to self-diagnose. You're in a comfort zone and you like it. You don't want to change it. You, customers are just a pain in the neck. <clears throat> Microsoft. And um, <laughs> often, I don't know what you're laughing at. I didn't say anything. Um, often, we're not videoing this, right? No, we are. <laughs> um, what happens in the big rut is typically the organization, the enterprise, has got a lot of legacy income coming in. Uh, they might have a big endowment. I mean, a client of mine is Harvard University. They have $33 billion. They've been in the big rut since 1769. <laughs> they know that, and they're trying their best to change it, but you can't. And when you've got $33 billion in an endowment, why would you? And once you've hit the big rut, what is going to happen is you will eventually, it may take a very long time, but the entity will slide forward into the death rattle and it will die in its current state. People might buy out the name, the customer list, the patents, uh, Kodak are going through this process now. And on that really happy note, I'm going to, no, I'm not going to finish. I want to show you why this happens. I want to go back uh, over the first part of the cycle and give you some uh, indications as to why this occurs. 
at the outset of every venture of any validity, there's someone who's got the initial vision. Fair enough? I mean, somebody's going to be sitting at their kitchen table at 4 a.m., maybe even with a perfectly well-paid job, thinking, I can't take this anymore. I have to make this happen. This is important to me. And visionaries are passionate. They work at 30,000 foot. They're often charismatic, not always. Um, they, they're wonderful communicators. They're usually visual thinkers. They can paint a picture, and they can get people to really buy into their vision. And visionaries are the folks that start all of the, uh, the ventures that are worthwhile. The problem about visionaries is they're really, really passionate about absolutely squirrel. Oh. <laughs> this is the most important thing that we will ever do. Squirrel. <laughs> Some of you have seen Up, the Pixar movie, right? That's a squirrel. There's, no, never mind. <laughs> I know a few um, vision, passionate visionaries are here in the audience today. Um, and what happens is that visionaries know that uh, subliminally they are aware of their own limitations. And they know that on their own they won't get the organization through to the through early struggle because they're so fascinated with the vision that they keep tinkering and playing with that and sticking little extra bits on without doing the specific things that are needed to deliver on the ground. And so, subliminally, visionaries know that they need to go find themselves what I call an operator. And the operator is the person that says, love it, go and go make it happen. The operators take the vision, they're not comfortable with a blank sheet of paper, but they build trust and a symbiotic relationship with visionaries and they go make it happen. They'll go through walls, operators, that once they see what needs to be done, they will make it happen. They work nights, weekends, their relationships suffer, they're constantly in motion, they seem to be able to juggle a gazillion things, they release either pheromones or endorphins, I don't know, by just getting stuff done. <laughs> one of them's good, the other one's gooder, I, I always get them confused. I think it's the dolphins. Um, He's lost it. <laughs> what happens when the organization hits whitewater, however, is that these pair never saw a system or process that they didn't despise. To them, systems and processes are anathema. They get in the way of delivering results. These pair deliver quickly and frequently and built this business, uh, this enterprise, this venture through fun and they can't put the systems and processes in place that are necessary. They will try, and after two or three attempts, they'll realize we're no good at this, because particularly the visionary will intellectually understand the need for systems and processes, but who do you think they think the systems and processes are for? Everybody but them. <laughs> squirrel. You can't unsquirrel me. Unchain. No, that's too bad. So. so. What happens is, to get through Whitewater, eventually the enterprise has got to either raise up from within the organization or find from somewhere else uh, what I call a processor. And that's somebody who's got a mindset that is defaulted towards putting systems and processes in place. Can you see how important that is? If you're going to get through the stage that I call Whitewater and get to the point of predictable success, You've got to have these three elements. You've got to have the vision. You've got to have the person who's getting it done. But if you want to scale, you've got to have people putting systems and processes in place to make it replicable, to make it repeatable. What's happening in fun is we're, de we're delivering consistent quality in the face of simplicity, relative simplicity. If we really want to change the world, if we really want to make a big difference, we've got to learn to deliver consistent quality in the face of complexity. And that requires putting systems and processes in place. And what I spent most of my career doing was helping build this understanding that you needed all of these if you want to scale. There's nothing wrong, by the way, having tried it a couple of times, for the visionary and the operator who are a highly symbiotic team and who work well together, understand each other well, finish each other's sentences. Ah, damn, I usually do that and then don't finish the sentence and then that gets a laugh and I forgot it. 
Um, you think I had time to burn, wouldn't you? Um, it's perfectly valid to go back to here. In fact, what I want to um, uh, gift to you is if you recognize this whitewater phase and it's burnt you out and you don't like it, one of the great things to do is to consciously decide we're not going there. We're not going to that scalability. We're going to keep doing something really, really well in this geographic location, in this micro community, in this sliver of demographic. There's not, not only is there nothing wrong with that, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to do. But if you want to scale, and there's no difference morally or ethically in deciding to or not to, it's just whatever you want to do. You've got to learn to make this trio work. The problem is, this is not a stable triangle. And this is what I had to spend the last third of my career discovering is that these three are all needed, but they're not enough. What happens is they clash. The biggest clashes are between the visionary and the processor. Visionary thinks seven times faster than everybody else. I don't mean they're seven times more intelligent. They just think that something that they think will take an hour, it actually is going to take a day. The visionary say, hey, come in here. Go, let's do this. Only it's going to take us an hour. Take a fucking day. <laughs> because they have no concept of the granular detail of what needs to get done. The operator learns to sandbag that and to work it out with the visionary. But then when you bring the processor in, guess what? Between the operator and the processor, there's a seven times time difference. The operator who's out there just making stuff done now has to fill in freaking forms. <laughs> Send back reports. Be in meetings! Okay, calm down, Leslie. I have a little operator tendency in me from time to time. An operator would rather open up a paper clip and stab themselves in the eye <laughs> than sit through one more meeting. And so a, there's a seven times differential here as well. But guess what that does between the visionary and the processor? There's a 40, almost a 50 times perception difference in the time it takes to get things done. So the visionary feels like they're being dragged down into molasses. Or as those of us who speak proper English would say, treacle. They don't get the treacle immersion. Try another tack. Okay, I'll rework that one in the nightclubs over the next three months. What I discovered was that in order to get here, when I watched uh, teams that really understood how to deliver high performance on a consistent basis, on a prolonged period. These three natural styles, we're all by default, one or usually actually two of these. We've got a primary style and a secondary style, the visionary operator and processor. If you want to, by the way, uh, you can go take a free quiz, synergistquiz.com, and find out what your own style is if you don't already intuitively recognize it, synergistquiz.com. When I see high-performing teams work, what happens is the members of the team learn subliminally, it usually takes between two to four years, which is a very long period of time, which is why so few organizations get there. They learn to step outside the constraints of being a visionary operator processor, not stop being a visionary operator or processor, but learn that they've got to go beyond that to a role that I call a synergist role. Didn't need to give it a name, but I did because it's what I observed was that visionaries and operators and processors learn to say, you know what, I can't just scratch my visionary itch. I can't make every meeting into a brainstorming session. I can't just walk in every Monday morning with a new fad book and give it out to everybody and say, this is what we're doing. There's nothing more important than squirrel. <laughs> operators needed to learn to sit in meetings. Pro processors needed to learn not to bring PowerPoint to everything they needed to do. He says, ironically pointing to a PowerPoint. It's actually Apple Keynote, so I'm cool. <laughs> that said, I hope this model has been helpful to you. Uh, I've got a couple of books. One of them's in the pack that uh, you can buy that the folks have put together. Predictable Success covers the uh, life cycle. The individuals, the styles are in a book called The Synergist. But what I want to point your attention to is if you're really interested in this question of pattern recognition, I want to recommend two books to you. One is Christopher Alexander's book, A Pattern Language. It's about town planning, <laughs> but it's wonderful, it's beautiful, and it was the book that made me recognize that there would be similar underlying patterns in the development of organizations. It's well worth a look. And a very hard book, uh, Julian James' Origin of the Consciousness of the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. I don't even understand the title, and I've read it four times. 
but there's some stuff in there about how we think and recognize patterns that's beautiful. I hope this has been helpful. I hope it's been enjoyable. It's been lovely to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Les. I got one question for you. So sometimes that white water phase or one of those kind of struggle phases seems to take a long time to get through. What a, words of encouragement could you give if people were in those phases right now? None whatsoever. You're screwed. <laughs> um, I would say that what uh, has been a great pleasure for me is noticing that simple recognition. Uh, one of the things that I worked out really hard was to try to make these words and phrases and vocabulary intuitive and simply recognizing what's going on that this isn't just a random attack of the heebie-jeebies that this is a systemic problem we need to bring a processor in that the founding group will react against that and find it really tough but if they want to make it happen they just got to keep biting their bottom lip and force through it so just recognition of the thing is 80 percent of the battle it's fantastic all right thank you Les, for joining us we'll hear more from you in a little bit Perfect. thank you